Let's turn together in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 4. We're going to continue our sermon series through this book, and we're starting a new section of the series today. So if you've missed the previous sermons, I'd encourage you to go to um, our podcast or the YouTube channel and, and catch up. But today we're camping out in a chapter of Scripture that is absolutely mind-blowing. And so I, I, don't, I can't remember the last time I, I learned so much studying for a sermon. And I kick myself for not uh, studying the book of Revelation before now. But it's providential timing for me, for you, for us. And as we go into chapter 4, I want us to think about how the original audience felt as they heard this letter for the first time. Jesus just dropped the hammer down on the church in Laodicea. And so there's seven churches that, and he specifically addressed all seven. And there's not an intermission in the original letter. So Jesus has just dropped the hammer down on the church in Laodicea, and now it rolls right into chapter four. This is not a sermon series in the original. The Apostle John is not teaching a series of sermons from the island of Patmos. He is writing a letter. Jesus is writing a letter through him. It was meant to be read in one sitting. It's a letter. The original version didn't have chapter breaks and verses. And it takes approximately 70 minutes to read from start to finish, from the beginning of Revelation to the end of Revelation. We know it now as the book of Revelation, but that original audience, it wasn't a part of a sacred book. It wasn't a book of the Bible. It was a letter that they were receiving from their pastor, the Apostle John. And it was being read by their local leader, their local elder, their local pastor to their congregation on a Sunday morning. And it was meant to be read all together. So we're taking it section by section and we'll probably spend all together 36 weeks in the book of Revelation. Think about that for a moment though. The original audience heard it all in one setting that probably took around 70 minutes and we're going to spend approximately 27 hours studying this letter, slicing and dicing and examining um, portion by portion and section by section. So I want us to not just intellectually or theologically understand this book, but also to visually and emotionally connect with it. This book is intentionally disruptive. And Jesus uses these, these visual images to capture our attention and to captivate our imaginations and to shape our convictions. So John takes the original audience on a roller coaster ride that in which they experience the full range of emotion. The book of Revelation is not a carousel. The book of Revelation is not a Ferris wheel. It's an apocalyptic roller coaster that at times is exhilarating and at other times is absolutely terrifying. Imagine what the apostle John as a person that was probably 80 years old, towards the very end of his life, uh, exiled, banished to an island to die. Imagine what he felt as he saw these things that he recorded in the book of Revelation. The ecstatic joy, the rapturous delight, the euphoria, the absolute ecstasy of being transported from exile on a bleak island to the very heart of heaven. With that in mind, let us read this mesmerizing chapter together and allow the Holy Spirit to captivate our imaginations with the word of God. Revelation chapter 4. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, 
and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were, co and, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings, and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Wow. I mean, this is a breathtaking passage of Scripture. And so I want us to not just open up our minds, but to open up our hearts not just open up our intellect, but to engage this scripture with our emotions. The chapter begins with a command to behold. John is not making a statement. He is giving a command. This is the most frequent command in the book of Revelation. Behold. So John is seeing and he's commanding us. He's commanding the original audience and he's commanding us as kingdom people today to look. So John is just stunned by what he's seeing, that he has taken Jesus, he is in the spirit, and Jesus has, has, has possessed him, the spirit has taken him into the very heart of heaven, into the throne room. And he's, he's looking, and, and that original audience, I want, us to, I want us to be on the edge of our seats with that original audience. I want us to be tensed up with that original audience of what is coming next. What is he going to see next? Right, Just that gasp, that sense of wonder and exhilaration, this apocalyptic roller coaster where you're anticipating what's coming next. The most frequent command in the book of Revelation is to behold, to look. He wants us to see what he saw. There is a lot happening in this chapter of Scripture. John wants us to look closely, right? We don't want to do a drive-by tour of the book of Revelation, right, where you kind of just glance out the window. Right? It's like driving by the Grand Canyon and saying that you've been there. Just because you saw it out the window going 60 miles an hour, the Grand Canyon, technically you can say you saw it, but you don't really know what it looks like until you stop, you park, and you ponder. I've been there, and you stand on the edge, and it's breathtaking, right? This, this scenery. So I want us to see the biblical scenery. I want us to put it in park. And John wants us to put it in park and to take it all in. The most constant refrain in the previous section was, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The ears of faith. For this section, we need another spiritual sense, sight. 
John wants us to see what he saw in Ephesians chapter 1. And, I, and this is very important here because it's not just reading it with our eyes. It's perceiving it with our spirit. It is seeing it with our hearts. And so let me read this here in Ephesians chapter 1, talking about the spiritual senses and the spiritual sense of sight. The Apostle Paul says to the church in Ephesus, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Here it is, verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. It's very interesting there where in verse 18, the apostle Paul prays that the eyes of their heart would be opened that they might perceive what God has done and is doing. Too often we see with physical eyes and we don't perceive the activity of God. We don't see with a kingdom perspective because we're seeing things from a human level. Too many kingdom people have a secular worldview. We don't have a biblical worldview. And the, and, and the apostle John is giving us this lens through which to interpret our reality. The apostle John is giving us this kingdom perspective that we see our circumstance through the lens of our biblical worldview. The Apostle Paul says he, in verse 18, and, and in the original language, enlightened is the first word in the Greek sentence, right? And the word order communicates emphasis. It's a way for the author of highlighting a particular word or a specific truth. And that's what the, the Apostle Paul says here in Ephesians 1.18. Enlightened. That's how he starts the verse, the sentence. Enlightened the eyes of your heart. He's praying that the eyes of our heart would be open. It starts in our hearts. How many people that have an intellectual understanding of the gospel, but it has yet to reach their hearts? Jesus said of the religious people of his day, they confess me with their mouths, but their hearts, it's the same word here in the Greek, car cardia, but their cardia, their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain. How many people are attending church in vain because the gospel is lodged on a shelf in their mind and it's never touched their heart? The eyes of our heart might be opened so that we can see who Jesus is. Yes, who he was, but who he is right now. That's the point of Revelations chapter 4 and 5, this new section of the letter. It's who Jesus is right now has a direct and radical impact. It should theologically have a direct impact on my life today. This is the first step in our salvation. This is where faith is conceived, not in the mind, but in the heart. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God, who said, let light shine out, shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. And that, that, this is what the Apostle John is seeing He's an eyewitness to what Paul says here, God's glory displayed in the faith, face of Christ. And this is, that was Revelation chapter 1, when the apostle John saw Jesus, the glory of God in the face of Christ. His, his face was shining like the sun in all its brilliance. He had a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. And then we see in Revelation 4, we just read this glorious atmosphere that Jesus is in right now. 
He says uh, that John sees the first things that things John says, look, behold, and what does he see first? An open door. This is awesome news. We're able to, he sees that the, the door of, of heaven is open. It's not shut. It's open for now. The, the, this door in heaven will not always be open. Right, the way that's written in, in the language of the Bible uh, in, the, in the present tense means that it's continually open. It wasn't just open for John for this, for this private tour of the throne room. Right? It's open now for whoever would believe, whoever would, by, by faith alone, through grace alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, step through the door and and receive Christ. The door is not light years away, it's very near. It's one of the things I was thinking about this week with this passage, is that the Apostle John physically was still on the island. So he was having church by himself. He was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, and he received incredible revelation. And so physically, I believe he was still sitting on this bleak island but spiritually he was he was transported transported in a moment is that the kingdom that what john is describing is not light years away it's very near it's very near we don't have to travel through a wormhole to reach it. We don't have to travel through galaxies to find heaven. Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is near. It is in our midst. The king is at the center of the kingdom. The throne is where the king sits. This is what John is describing in Revelation chapter 4, and it is very near. It's not geographically distant. It is spiritually present. Now, it's another dimension that is a breath away, a thought away. There is a thin veil between heaven and earth, and kingdom people are already connected to the king. This is why we are called children of light in a world of darkness. The light has its source in the throne room of the king. We are ambassadors of another kingdom that is very near. John's body is on earth, and yet he gets a tour of another dimension, a greater reality. The ultimate reality is spiritual, not physical. This is a biblical worldview. It's not just an alternate dimension. It is the ultimate dimension. All else is a shadow of this ultimate reality. It's not far away. It's very near. It's a breath away. John enters the door, and the first thing he sees is a throne with someone sitting on it. The throne is the most dominant image in the book of Revelation. John refers to this throne 47 times. It's obvious to John where the focus was. He didn't have to ask around. He didn't have to go to one of the heavenly creatures and ask for directions to the throne room. As soon as he entered the door, it was obvious. It was obvious to him where the focus of heaven was. His eyes were immediately drawn to the throne and to the one sitting on it. And John is bombarded with unimaginable beauty. John is bombarded with the glory of the kingdom. It is breathtaking. It is stunning. The human vocabulary is woefully inadequate to describe what John is experiencing. He uses, uh, his, he uses his experience as a way of trying to describe what he is seeing. The jasper is a translucent stone of various colors, especially that of fire. The ruby is red and emerald is green. Fire, if you watch a fire in, in, in a fireplace or a fire pit, fire is multiple shades of red and orange, and it's constantly shifting and changing. 
what John is seeing is, is light refracting from countless crystals producing a perpetual swirl of dazzling rainbows. John is enveloped in awesome radiance, dazzling beyond description, a supernatural kaleidoscope of color, a rainbow swirling around the throne, creating a whirlwind of vibrant colors. It makes me think of the Aurora Borealis. I've had the opportunity of seeing it multiple times here in Canada. And I remember one time in particular when I lived in Calgary and I was delivering newspapers at three in the morning. And I remember looking up and seeing this light show in the heavens. Now, most of the time, the other times I've seen it, it's been this emerald color, right? This kind of, this, this green color. And it's, it's shifting and dancing. That's what it looks like to me. Lights are dancing against the canvas of the night sky. But this one time in Calgary, when I looked up and it was one of those jaw drop moments because there was red mixed in with the green. And it was all swirling together, you know? And that's what came to my mind, right? Where you just stop and your mouth drops open and you are speechless because you don't know how to describe, to adequately describe what you're seeing. I'll post a video later of the Aurora Borealis and when I, I'll post it on uh, my Facebook sites. And, and I want you to watch it and think about these colors swirling around the throne of Jesus, of what John saw, not just from a distance, but he is in the midst of the colors as it's happening, swirling around him. He's called up in this cyclone of color. The throne is pulsating with brilliance and glory and infinite calm and absolute power. One commentator says, the imagery tells us that we are dealing with someone terribly awesome. The transcendent Jesus should cause us to tremble with a holy fear. There should be a sacred silence as his splendor makes us speechless. The eminence of Jesus is an essential part of the gospel, right? The humanity of Jesus is an essential part of our theology. But may we never focus on his eminence at the expense of his transcendence. May we never focus on his humanity at the cost of his divinity. And so as that commentator said, when we, when we approach Jesus, we're dealing with someone terribly awesome. John sees 24 other thrones that are surrounding this primary throne. And it's obvious, again, his eyes were immediately drawn to the to the main throne, the primary throne. And these 24 other thrones are surrounding the throne of Jesus. God is surrounded by successive circles of servants, the, the, the four living creatures that are surrounding the throne, the 24 elders, the myriad of angels, and Jesus is at the center of it all. Every eye in heaven focused on the same thing. Every gaze in heaven looking the same way at the same person. Jesus, the King of Kings. The sights and sounds are truly overwhelming. This is the ultimate multi-sensory experience. What John is seeing, what John is hearing, what John is smelling. And we'll talk a little more about this next week as the incense of heaven, right? Our physical senses, again, our ability to hear, our ability to 
see, our ability to taste, our ability to smell, our ability to touch are just shadows of the ultimate reality. They're just, they're just samples of when we are in the presence of Jesus, we'll experience these things in their fullness in a way that we can only experience partially now. But John is, is seeing and hearing and smelling heaven and worship. The flashes of lightning and the rumbles and peals. It says the rumblings and peals of thunder. And they're emanating from the throne. This is not a storm in heaven, right? So there's not this atmosphere in heaven and there's this storm. It's all emanating from the same place. It's the epicenter of the universe is the throne of God. The glory of God displayed in the face of Christ. It's the Godhead. It's the Trinity. And everything is connected. Everything in the universe, every beat of every heart, every breath that comes from, from, from our lungs is connected to this ultimate source of life and power. If the throne ceased to exist, then everything would disintegrate. That's the, the, the power source of everything. So the lightning and the thunder, the brilliance of worship around the throne, the roar. I mean, just imagine. I mean, these, uh, imagine with me what John is hearing, the roar of worship around the throne. Day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And they're not whispering this. They are declaring this. And the, the 24 elders are constantly standing up off of their thrones. These are subordinate thrones. They're standing up off of their thrones and they're falling down on their faces. Right? This is passionate worship. This is worship that is, involves not just our minds, but our bodies. It is, the, it is the position of our heart, but it's also the posture of our bodies. And, and these, these elders are crying out. And it's simultaneous. Like this is all happening. And John is trying to take it all in. He saw seven lamps blazing with the seven spirits of God. The number seven in the Bible equals perfection, completeness, wholeness. The seven blazing lamps represent the perfect light that emanates from his being and fills the room. The, 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 the comprehensive spirit of the, of the living God. The uninterrupted, unadulterated, uncontaminated, pure presence of God. No deceit, no games, no ulterior motives, no coercion, no intimidation, no pretense, just pure, undiluted light. The swirling, pulsating colors emanating from the throne are reflected on the crystal sea. The sea is like glass. It's completely calm. There's no disturbance. There's no turmoil. There's no chaos. The sea in our world is notoriously uncertain and dangerous. However, there is never any uncertainty in the throne room. King Jesus never paces the floor. He is never surprised. There is complete clarity and total transparency. The awesome power of the ocean is stilled in his presence. Even the water worships the king. Revelation 4 gives us a picture of ultimate worship. Why did Jesus allow John to see all of this? Then why did he want us to know what John saw? 
The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 12 that the Apostle Paul was given a special tour of heaven, but was not allowed to share his experience with others. It was just for him. It was a private tour for the Apostle Paul. But John's vision is different. Jesus wants us to know what is happening in heaven and what has happened, not what was happening then, several thousand years ago when the Apostle John was actually experiencing it, but what is happening right now? What John saw then is happening right now, and it's not in some distant galaxy. It is the kingdom is here. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so the kingdom is invading earth through the church, the children of light, the kingdom people. Kingdom people are a colony of heaven on earth. But John was allowed to see this, and then he commanded others to study what he saw. Jesus wants us to know what's happening right now. One commentator said, when we go to worship, we are always entering a service that is already in progress. Our worship should always be a reflection of the worship that is happening in heaven. Jesus is at the center of it all. Jesus is the object of worship. Jesus is the heart of worship. So you have, you have these billions of angels, these legions of angels that are surrounding the throne, that are worshiping the lamb that was slain, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. You have these 24 elders on subordinate thrones that are falling down on their faces before the throne, before the king of kings. You have these living creatures, right? These these strange creatures that are surrounding four, the four different corners of the throne. And day and night, they are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. That's the only quality of God mentioned in triplicate in the Bible. That's the only quality of Jesus that's mentioned in triplicate. And in, in the language of the Bible, repetition is emphasis. So if you say something in the Bible, it's important. If you say it twice, it's really important. And it's rare. If you say it three times, it is the, of the utmost. It's extremely important. And so they, they don't look at Jesus and say, he's love, love, love. They look at Jesus and fall on their faces and say, holy, holy, holy. To have this holy fear in the presence of the glory, the power, the awesomeness of King Jesus. We don't need to be creative when it comes to worship. There is one song being sung in heaven 24 hours a day for eternity. Every expression of earthly worship should flow from what's happening in heaven. Our worship is a shadow of what's happening in heaven. Therefore, biblical worship is never fundamentally original. It should be intentionally redundant. We don't get to define worship. That's way above our pay grade. right? When we make the creation... When, you, when we make humanity the object of worship, our feelings, our hopes, our dreams, our desires, then it becomes, it becomes idolatry, right? It becomes this moralistic, therapeutic religion, right? It becomes this, this hallmark Christianity, right? That's, that's based on sentiment, rather than scripture. So to unapologetically be redundant in our worship and to repent of our arrogance that we think we can improve upon the worship of heaven. And so if you're a worship leader, I want to free you of any pressure that you might feel to be 
creative. It's not your calling to be creative. It's not my job as a preacher of the Bible to be creative, right? My job is to preach the word, right? I'm not here to improve the word. I'm not here to modify the word. I'm not here to sugarcoat the word and the job of worship leaders is to do what they're doing in heaven, to lead the church, to worship, to align, to join the worship service that's already in progress, right? And to spiritually step into that room with the angels and the elders and the creatures and to join them in their worship of Jesus. Think about this original audience. Okay, so what was, the, how did they receive this, right? You have, you have different churches in different cities that had different struggles, but that original audience, things were pretty bad, really bad. And things weren't going to get any better anytime soon. So this is critical here because Jesus is giving them this revelation in the midst of hardship, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of persecution. Things weren't going to get any better for a long time. Let me read, uh, this is just from one commentary here. Times were hard, really hard. Rome was tightening its grip, becoming more and more repressive. The government was becoming more and more corrupt and increasingly hostile toward Christianity. In 57, the Emperor Nero began feeding Christians to the lions. Peter and Paul were crucified during that period. In 95, the Emperor Domitian was expanding his reign of terror. He had more than 40,000 Christians killed. Timothy was beaten to death during this period. In AD 96, John was exiled to Patmos, left, left to rot and bleach on the rock. So this is, this is the atmosphere that the original audience, the environment that they heard this letter in for the first time. The church would endure seasons of severe persecution for hundreds of years after they received this letter from Jesus. Some had been, the people in the original audience had either been persecuted themselves or personally knew someone that had been persecuted. Some had been murdered. They all had heard about the murder of these leaders of the church, of the apostle Paul, of Peter, right? And, and they knew that their pastor, John, uh, had been um, persecuted, had been tortured, and now was exiled to an island to die. That's the environment of the original audience. So I want to keep that in mind because this vision of King Jesus fueled their perseverance through great hardship. That's one of the, that's one of the primary purposes of Jesus giving us the gift of revelation, the book of revelation. Things are not as they appear to be. Right, so in, in the culture of the original audience, Rome was the one world superpower. And Rome liked to display its power. Rome liked to showcase its power to, to control and intimidate. And so Jesus is saying that things are not as they appear to be. He's telling the church then, and he's telling the church now that he is on the ultimate throne, that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we find great solace in his sovereignty. As we begin to wrap our hearts around the vision of the throne room, one question kept coming to my mind. How can we ever hope to even get in the vicinity of such a place? The description of this place sounds foreign 
to us. Revelation 116, Revelation 116 says that the face of Jesus is like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. The brightness is overwhelming. We shield our eyes. We shield our eyes from his brilliance. Someday, every knee will bow before this throne and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Such is the magnitude of his glory that even his enemies acknowledge his power. His light penetrates and reveals everything. His holiness cannot tolerate sinfulness. His wrath is a byproduct of his holiness. Because of our sin, we would be immediately repelled by his holiness, banished from his presence and under his wrath. Let me give you another snapshot here as we wrap up today. In Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two, with two wings they covered their face, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Listen to his reaction. This is my reaction. Right? This is your reaction. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. This is the prophet Isaiah, one of the holiest men on the planet at the time, and yet he gets a glimpse of who Jesus is. He gets, he gets a peek behind the curtain and he says, woe to me, I am ruined, I am undone. The message says, I'm as good as dead. Every word I've ever spoken is tainted, blasphemous even. And the people I live with uh, talk the same way, using words that corrupt and desecrate. And here I've looked God in the face, the king, the God of the angel armies. How can people like us, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? And so our sinfulness and his holiness are mutually exclusive. And this is where the gospel comes in. This is why the gospel is such good news. The gospel gives us access to his glory through Jesus Christ. We aren't just allowed into the city. There are no slums in heaven. We aren't just allowed into the building. We aren't just allowed into the room. We are invited to sit with him on his throne, to share in his glory, and to reign with him. Ephesians 3.12 says, because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. Let this revelation captivate us. Let it, let it fill us with awe and wonder. Let it flood our lives with kingdom light. We don't wait for death to experience his glory. We'll ex we experience it now through the Holy Spirit. We are connected to the Jesus of Revelation 4 right now. Our souls attached to his throne and our lives should pulsate with his power. Let us join now with the worship service that is always in progress. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this amazing part of scripture. God, it's, it's beyond comprehension. Our, our greatest efforts at understanding just scratch the surface of who you are. And so God, thank you for your grace. It's only by grace that we can communicate with you. And even now, even now, 
Lord, your word says that our prayers fill the bowls of the elders and they are poured out like incense in your presence. Even now, our prayers right now are a part of this heavenly worship experience, this heavenly worship service right now. Our prayers are in that air as incense. So help this, help this revelation to shape our worldview. Oh God, open the eyes of our hearts by your spirit. Help us to see our reality through the lens of the kingdom. Help us to interpret our circumstances, Lord, through the the kingdom filter to not see things as they physically are, but by faith to perceive the greater reality. And may that reality fill our lives with your power, with the hope that comes from who you are right now and who we are in you right now as sons and daughters of the King, as children of light in Jesus name. Amen.